it's okay. white, <laughs> and I get uncomfortable. <laughs> it is Wednesday, April 24th, and we are back to the future. <laughs> we did have a movie call then. <laughs> we're not going to watch a movie today. <laughs> One day we're going to see it from the bleacher seats, though. <laughs> Actually, not even the bleacher seats, because we're going to come down with it. We are coming back into Revelation chapter 20. I see it we got on 21. We want to go back to Revelation 20. And when I say go back it, to the future, it's because this is future. Revelation 20 deals with the millennial um, kingdom on earth. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we have finally made it. Battle of Armageddon is over. And when we left off, we had really covered verse 1. So in quick rapidity for verse 1, we saw that an angel, just a normal, regular, not the archangel, not one of the ones that, that is superior, just a, a normal, I can't say every day, but you know, a normal angel that came down from heaven and had the key which shows control and authority to the abyss, to the bottomless pit. He had a great chain in his hand. That chain could be literal because the same word is used literally in other scriptures. Or it could be figuratively to explain to us what he's going to do with that. And that's where we're coming in in verse 2. We're going to see that he seized the dragon. Y'all hate Satan. Are you tired of him bugging you? Are you ready to see part one of his demise? Are you ready to shout hallelujah? We're finally getting there. This one who has been more than the fly in the ointment, more than the thorn in your side, this one who has taken down as many as he could, who put out that great deceit, uh, deceit to deceive the nations, who has to know that he's not going to win. So his intent and thought must be, I'll take as many with me as I can. He is now going to be confined. Hallelujah. He is taken down. This angel seizes hold of him or laid hold of the, of the dragon. And lest you wonder if I'm not saying the right one, well, let's look at the description, okay? And if you can come up with anyone else who fits this description, then so be it. You tell me. He's called the dragon. He's called that ancient serpent, who is the devil, and Satan, Satan in Hebrew, the adversary. Now, what's that, five names? Dragon, serpent, devil, Satan, and adversary. Five names. Anybody disagree with me? <laughs> no. I think we know. I think it's nailing it. And what's he saying in all this when he refers to him being the dragon? We think of this murderous character. We think of this embodiment of evil. I think of the fire-breathing dragon that just destroys everything in his sight and, and devours everything. He's called the dragon because he's like the dragon. In fact, in the Gospel of the Stars, he's represented as Draco the dragon. And you see a flood come out of his mouth when he's wanting to, to go after... Um, he couldn't get the Messiah who's gone back up into heaven, but he's going after the woman, which represents Israel, and the rest of her offspring, those who have the testimony of Yeshua and keep the commandments of God. So the God is going against believers. That's who this is, this dragon, this murderous character. When it refers to him as a serpent, does it not take you all the way back to Bereshit, all the way back to the beginning? the very start of what we know of our human race that takes us all the way back to where he was a deceiver with cunning deception. He came to Eve in such a conniving way that he was able to get her to question what God had said and able to get her to fall and through her to get her husband to fall. He also was a deceiver before that of the angels because we find that when he came up against God because he wanted God's position and God in essence kicks him out of heaven he wasn't kicked out permanently yet we know that took place a little later in time but he was kicked down from having his his rights he wasn't he loses the kingdom that he had which was this earth and he loses some of, of his power and ability to be ruling over others but we see a third of the angelic world followed him. So he deceived a third of them in the very presence of God. How many of you women don't like snakes? 
<laughs> you know, and what God said to be enmity between his seed and her seed, I think it comes right down to us. I think it's why we don't like snakes, is because that is just slimy and deceptive. And, you know, I realize there is a beauty in all of God's creation. It's just that part gets lost on me, I'll be honest. <laughs> yes, there is a big fear there. Okay, so. We're, we're being what we're, what's being reinforced here though why is he using these names he's showing who this is the one who from the beginning of mankind has been this creepy <laughs> conniving cunning deceiver this is who is being referred to and then he's called what he is the devil a malicious slanderer an accuser of the saints he goes before God the audacity of him Look at your servant, Rochelle. Look at what she's doing. And she's one of yours. Thank God for the intercessor, Yeshua, who says, uh, 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 uh. my blood's washed that sin away. Amen. You yes. can't hold that against her. She's loved. She's loved by me. She's loved by the Father. But this is who we're, we're being reminded of, what he is like in Satan. We know Satan. We know that's the great adversary against God. If nothing else, if I didn't see the evil he did in this world, if I didn't hate him for what he does to my fellow brethren as well as myself, when I see him fly in the face of my God, when I see this one who in essence wants to poke his finger in God's eye, when I see this one who wants to say, I'm the one that should be worshipped, and then see what kind of a master he is to those who do worship him, the exact opposite of the loving God who wants to be master controller in our lives. The one who wants to do everything for us for good and not for evil. And he wants to do everything for evil and not for good. I could go on and on. I know I'm preaching to the choir, but this is the one. The enemy of my God. The enemy of my Savior. Do you know what he was doing in the Garden of Gethsemane? When my Lord was in agony, he was right there whispering in his ear, just adding, compounding layer on layer on layer, attacking him, mocking him. All that was done, all the way up through to that point of his life being taken from him. And I shouldn't say it that way because the Lord willingly gave his Amen. life. But you know what I mean. And I think that the moment that Yeshua died in his human form, because his godly form did not, but in his human form, I think Satan was dancing. I think he thought, oh, I've got the victory. But when we just celebrate last Sunday, <laughs> joy comes in the morning. Victory belongs to my God. Victory belongs to the Lord. Victory belongs to Yeshua, who said, I am. Not I was, I am the one who is alive, the one who I've had the privilege of stepping into his tomb. And I don't look for, is there anything left that I can remember him by? No. No, in that tomb, and those of you who have been there, don't you feel it? You feel the resurrection power. You feel the awesomeness of what happened in that moment. That stone was rolled away to show what happened, not to let him out. He was already out. He had arisen. He was alive forever. <coughs> Hallelujah. And this one, in that resurrection power, is the one that Satan has gone after and after those who love him and finally is beginning to get what he deserves. He is now being bound. He is put into the pit. What's a bottomless pit like? I don't know. But the thought of it scares me completely. Have you ever been on a ride? I won't go on it where the bottom falls out and you're, you're held, held to the side by some trivial force. I want to do it. I, I don't do service at all. <laughs> but can you imagine feeling like there's no 
bottom under your feet. And can you imagine feeling like you're falling continually? Can you imagine the darkness of the pit, the slime? And then look at his companions who is in the pit also. It's the demons. Remember when chapter 9 opened up and the demons that came out, some of the worst that came out, came out of this pit. He's finally the company he deserves. He's finally where he deserves to be. He is finally confined so that the people who are living on the earth during the millennial time that we're going to touch on in this class, I promise, Lord helping me, we're going to do it today. He can't go after them like he does to you and to me every single day. Have you ever had one day Satan free? Mm -hmm. No. No. And if not he, his henchmen, which do it in his name. You know, we can't tell the difference, but I mean, we just know he is after us continually, nipping at the heels. He's always at you. You get that moment of victory and he wants to steal it, or he wants to knock you out before you get to that moment of victory. And don't let him, because the greater is he who is in you than he that is in the world. Amen. You have that resurrection power in you because you have the very spirit of God in you. Do you realize the gift you were given when Yeshua went back up to heaven? He said, if I don't go up, the, the Spirit wouldn't come, come down to you. But he told his Talmudim, wait for the power. Wait for the power on high. That power that knocked through that room that was like a mighty rushing wind that caused them to be able to give out the gospel in language that they had never studied that looked like tongues of fire on their heads, they were let. You'd think I'd get excited. They were let. <laughs> let us be like that because that's the power that we have. So even though I'm giving you this, this picture of how horrible he is, don't give him a moment's victory in your life today. <clears throat> when he bugs you, remind him of his future. <laughs> get away from me, you right. slimy, you you devil, you adversary, you serpent, you dragon. You're going to end up in a pit, and after that, you're going to end up cast in the lake of fire forever and ever 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 and ever. And I've only just begun. Hallelujah. So don't give it to him. But here I'm rejoicing because the people who will live during the millennium will not have the same one at them constantly to get them to sin. And doesn't he do that? He trips you up and gets you to sin, entices you to do it, and then tells you how bad you are for doing it. You know? Isn't that just like him? Get you to do it, and then, oh, look at you. you know, why would God love you? Why would he want anything to do with you? Well, because God loves unconditionally. And he loved us when we weren't lovely. He loved us when we were full of sin and dirt and filth and nothing good in us. So, Satan, you can't throw anything at me. My God's love is greater. And I'm told it can't separate. I can't be separated from the love of God. Not height, depth, width, above, below. No way, no how, nothing can separate me from the love of my God. Hallelujah. So even though we're, we're seeing a change and I'm happy for them, we still have reason to rejoice today because of who is in us. So he is bound. Now by being bound, this shows us that he must have some sort of a spiritual body because we know he's not human like us. But in some way, with that chain, whether it, it is symbolic or not, in some way, Satan is bound. There's going to be a lid put on this pit and he can't push it open. He's stuck. Yeah. Sorry, but I've had enough of him, especially this past week. I'll be honest. Okay, so if I'm glorying a little bit in it, yeah. <laughs> yes, sure. Raquel, I don't mean to interrupt you, but do you feel as though the forces of hell are more prevalent right now in the United States than they ever have been? We oh, are yes. so yes. divided yes. as a country, yes. 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 and the hate yes. is so, I mean, you could cut it with a knife, the yes. hate is there. Yes, the days are becoming more and more evil, yeah. and that's what Bible. you're feeling, the and Bible it is. Tells it tells us that the end days will be. It will be as it was in the days of Noah. How did they describe the days of Noah? Man's thoughts were only evil continually. Now, think about Noah alone, okay? Noah, Noah had his family. We know that because we know the family gets on the ark and the family is saved. Who else goes on the ark? 
Humans Who else goes on the animal? Okay, so their family are they not? We call our in-laws in love. Yeah. We don't we don't separate. That's the family. So Noah, his sons, their wives, and Noah's wife. Mr. and Mrs. Noah, three sons, three wives. We got a family of eight, right? Okay. How many years did Noah preach? Twenty to be building the ark. So I think the testimony was going out about 120 years. Now, and I, what I was thinking, because I think he was 80 when yeah. he started building it. We get, you get so into yeah. So you get into the numbers, and that's how we know. Now. We know that when Noah started, there was Methuselah who knew the Lord. There was, I think, if I remember right, well, I'm not going to go out on the limb because I found it, my mind's rusty. But my point being, there were a few other believers that we are told about in the scripture, but by the time we get to that 120th year, Methuselah, the last believer outside of Noah's, Noah's family, has now, how do I say it? He's now in the heart of the earth, okay? He's no longer living. His soul is, but he's not. Okay, so here's my point. He preached and he preached and he preached. He gave testimony by virtue of his life, let alone whatever words came out of his mouth, to people, to his neighbors. You have to know that when those animals started coming supernaturally, because all animals were got representation on the ark, you have to know that was a testimony of the people around. They had to be thinking, what is going on? Yes, they didn't know what rain was. Yes, they didn't understand blood is coming. But the warning was going out in such a way if any of them had wanted to know the truth, they could have. So here's my point. Everyone else was not believers. How many believers do we have in this room? A lot more than eight. We've got three times plus more than what Noah had around him. Wow. Now, if all those thoughts are only evil continually, we see how our world is going back to that. Is it going to get down to only eight souls that are believers? No, thank God it doesn't. But the times are going to be so much worse because with Noah, it wasn't that they were going through this plague and this bowl and this trial. It was just the witness going out to them. But during the time of the tribulation, living through those horrors that we've studied so well in detail, I think believers really are going to need each other to help each other get through it. They're going to need that support. But yes, the further we get from our God, the more evil is loose on this earth to do its dastardly, ugly deeds. And yes, that's what we're feeling where our nation used to stay closer to what we know is God's moral standards. We can see that as that's let down more and more, the evil comes up more and more. So absolutely, are you feeling it? Oh yes, you're feeling it. Are we seeing it around us? Yes, we're still seeing it around us, yes. In some ways there's nothing new under the sun, and in other ways it's a hundred times worse because it's just compounded and larger, more doing the evil. Um, I don't know, maybe not more because there are a lot of people alive in Noah's day too. But you're, you're getting my point, yes, it absolutely is. But here is the long suffering of our God. And the only thing that I can say to you for any kind of comfort why does God allow it to go on for so long? Is because he knows there's still those who will come to saving faith. And he's giving them time to get in that they might be spared that coming wrath. But there is a day coming when he does say, enough is enough, this is it, that body is complete in number, and here comes the rest. So it will come. It will come. Let me show you a little bit more about the spirits being chained. Second Kepa, Second Peter chapter two and verse four. We have in Second Peter chapter two and verse four, for God did not spare the angels who sinned. Remember I said when Satan wanted to dethrone God and wanted to sit in the highest point of heaven and get all the worship to him and what he's still trying to get. He got a third of the angels to follow with him. 
Well, at least some of those we're reading about right here. God did not spare the angels who sinned. On the contrary, he put them, in this sense, in gloomy dungeons, lower than Sheol, to be held for judgment. I'm not real thrilled over that gloomy dungeons. Let me get it in the American Standard. Um, that was the complete Jewish Bible, and it's good. It's got, it's got its good points, too. But 2 Peter 2, 4, New American, which I believe gives it a little... Um, it says he cast them into hell and committed to pits of darkness reserved for judgment. The pits of darkness, I believe, is referring to the abyss because we know it's a pit and it's dark, so I believe that's our language as the light. So apparently, out of those angels that followed Satan, there must have been some that were a greater degree of the sin against God. The same way that, that we see with Satan, that, that you know he was the greatest, but he has, and we know it. Um, okay, let me give you the good side. Let me flip it. We know God has archangels, at least at least Michael, Michael, and we believe Gabriel belongs in that category, Gabriel, okay? They're a hierarchy. We see that they're over others, and that they're used for Michael. Michael is a guardian of Israel. He's a guardian of a whole country, and a country that needs his guardianship. Okay, so we see God has his order, and then he has lesser, and probably it goes on down. We know there's a whole like governmental system, only a perfect one, not like our earth, but in heaven, because anything on earth is only mimicking what, what's in heaven, and only thing that Satan can do is counterfeit. So he's going to have his right-hand men. I'll put it that way, but like, like Hitler. Hitler didn't do everything, but he had goals, and he had... Um, Gargoyle. <laughs> and who do you say? Gargoyle. <laughs> okay. Um, but there's one I'm still trying to Demons. think of in my own. Um, Eichmann. Eichmann. Uh, yeah. Yeah. There's a chance that one of my relatives is the one who um, sealed his fate by his reports. Eichmann had tried to blow him away, and only by God's grace did he not. And he was the one that Israel um, used his, his recordings in court to sentence like wow. that. So that's a personal vendetta because that gets real close to my family. But anyway, the same way, Satan <laughs> apparently had those who were his right-hand men. And they were so bad also that God said in his mercy, I'm not going to allow them to be unleashed on the world. The world's going to have to deal with Satan and with his lessers, but these, I'm going to tie them under it by chains under darkness until the day of judgment they're not even let out they're so bad wow thank you god <laughs> we have enough <laughs> thank you god so that's what this is referring to some he, he cast some apparently directly into hell it sounds like some into the pit and they're being reserved for judgment if they're cast in hell they're not even there for judgment they they were so bad they don't even stand before God in judgment. Satan is one of those. We're going to see when he's finally cast in like a fire, he does not come up to the great white throne of judgment. He's just directly cast into the lake of fire. It's like God said there's not even any point of bringing you before the judgment seat. So that's what I'm trying to get across and trying to, to refer to you here. Look real quickly also at Jude 6. Jude only has one chapter, so it's we, we just call it by verses. But Jude 6 tells us, And the angels that did not keep within their original authority abandoned their proper sphere. He is kept in darkness, bound with everlasting chains for the judgment of the great day. And other versions will talk about that being under the waters. I think, again, New American puts it under the waters. And I'm looking it up real quick to see if I'm remembering right. In verse 6, um, no, it doesn't say it there either. But it gives us that idea under the depths of the ocean, that there is a holding place in darkness for the demons. Um, not not all, but for some of them, apparently these are so bad. That's one six. The abyss may also be right there, yes. We, we're given to believe that. I'm trying to think where, since I didn't get it in Second Peter and I didn't get it here. I probably have overlooked it. It probably was in Second Peter, So um, because I'm rereading here. Anyway, um, again, you know, they... They were in the very presence of God. We don't see God send them a savior like he does us. And I believe the difference, why he was willing to do that for human life and not for the angelic life, is they literally dwelt in the presence of God, in a perfect atmosphere, when this sin was found in them. 
the, it wasn't like us who the deception came and we haven't seen literally and we're not you know we know the presence of the Lord is with us but not where we're seeing it the way that they did and I believe that's why God had a little more mercy for the human being made in his image than for the angelic that were dwelling with him okay. you know if you have another reason that's fine but that's the most that I've been able to come up with with why didn't God provide salvation for the angels but we read of nowhere that he did so going back to revelation because i promise you we're gonna get there <laughs> revelation chapter 20 and now we are at verse well we're still in verse 2 okay so he's this angel has laid all the dragon the serpent all uh, the devil and satan or who is satan and he has bound him for a thousand years okay again he is bound he is restricted he is rendered completely inactive as far as the face of the earth is concerned. So on our map, in the time that we're talking about, the thousand year reign, because this is the second coming of the Lord, stop the battle of Armageddon, setting up his kingdom on earth right here. And that this is where we are, Revelation 20. This line that represents Satan all the way through time, where he was loose on, whoops, I'm sorry, loose on the earth, even in dwelt, the Antichrist is the midpoint of the tribulation. Now we watch this line come under, going into the abyss, and then he's going to be loose for a little time. We'll talk about that in just a few moments, and then he's going to go into the lake of fire. Okay, so that's following the line there. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I'm not sorry. <laughs> okay, for how long? If you were with me before, you remember I told you I take scripture literally. When it cannot be taken literally, then I look for the symbolic meaning. Sometimes I know there are both meanings, a literal and a symbolic, but if the scripture makes sense, I'm not going to make it make any other sense. I'm not, if it's common sense, leave it alone. Don't make it make nonsense, you know, just leave it be. Also, if God says it once, not only is it important, but he wants us to hear it. If he goes to the point of saying it six times, look down, how many, how many verses do we have in chapter 20? We have 15 verses. Six times in 15 verses. In fact, because it's verse 2 when we get the first one in 13 verses. Six times he's going to refer to it being a millennial kingdom. A thousand year reign. Millennial means thousand. I think he wants us to realize this is a thousand years. I take that very literally. So the whole thousand years. Here's our first time. The whole length of the Messianic kingdom. Satan is bound the whole time. He doesn't get out halfway through. He doesn't indwell someone like he does in the middle of the tribulation. He doesn't get to be sending out his little cohorts to do all his dastardly feats. He's bound the whole entire time. Okay, in fact, um, my notes are telling me it's six times in verses 2 to 7. I was thinking we had to get all the way down. I forgot in 2 yeah. to 7. And 6, by the way, is the number of man. Okay? Falls short of God's 7. His perfect. So I see that even though the millennial is representative of the kingdom, Satan, less than. That's, that's what I'm saying. He's not perfect. He's not complete. Messiah, as a perfect man, is going to rule over mankind. He's going to return to mankind that dominion that was lost when? When was it lost? Garden Eden. Bingo. You get A for the day. <laughs> All the way back in the Garden of Eden. Now remember I took you before and I'm going to bring you to that in verse 3. Um, let me just say it then I'm going to give you another thought and then we'll go see it. Okay? I believe that originally Satan's original kingdom was the earth. It was called Eden. Because we have when God created man, he put them in Eden, the garden of God. Okay? When Satan fell, he lost his kingdom. Okay? God had given him glories. God had made him beautiful. God had given him wonderful. He had no reason the need to be raised up and, and want to get in God's face. So when God st struck him down from that position, he also lost his kingdom. Now, if his kingdom was earth, and God's put someone new on the earth, 
and told them, have dominion over the earth, you know, then in essence we see the kingdom now has been given to Adam. And by the way, the creation as we read it was the restoration of this earth. And I'll go into that again in a bit. Just remind me if I forget to bring it out. So, and where am I going right now? Oh, sorry. Okay, so why did Satan go after Adam and Eve? Go. Right away, jealous. I want my kingdom back. I want to get at God who's made man in his image, who's looking at man the way maybe Satan felt that God used to look at him. And God's given him my kingdom. I want it back. So, bless you. So he goes after man and he gets man to fall. Man does spiritually die and now begins to physically die. He, in essence, does get back control. He is the prince of the power of the air. He is able to work on the face of this earth through humans, through his demonic angels. I hate to call them that, but, you know, demons. That's the better name, because that's what a demon is, a fallen angel. But anyway, so he is able to do that. But remember chapter 5? Can you go all the way back in your mind to chapter 5 when we got one of our first heavenly scenes? And we saw that there was a scroll in the hand of God, and it needed to be opened. And Yohanan cried because no one could be found worthy to open the scroll. No one in heaven, no one on earth, no one under the earth, no one around. Well, I shouldn't say not in heaven because John's looking around, Yohanan's looking around, and it is in heaven that it happens that the Lamb who looked as if he had been slain, because he wasn't slain now, but had been slain. He was the one that went and took the scroll out of the hand of God. That meant he had the authority. It belonged to him. He was going to be able to crack open the seals on that scroll, and only the one who owned it could. And as it was opened, we found out it was the grant deed to earth. Who bought back the domain to give it back the way God had wanted it in the first place? Yeshua Jesus. So Satan loses, even though he's gone after man for time. I agree with you, Eric. Hallelujah. He loses his control on this domain forever and ever once this has been settled. So having all that in mind, go back to verse, I think we've done verse 2. We talked about a thousand years. So verse 3, this angel is the one that's saying he. He threw him or he cast him into the abyss. I love it. I don't see a gentle picture here. <laughs> he gets thrown into the pit. Who wants to treat him nicely? He's done so much horror to people. He's getting the kind of treatment he deserves and, and then some. He throws him into the abyss. He's, it's shut up. It's shut. The abyss is shut and sealed over him so that he would not deceive the nations any longer. Here we go, set number two, until the thousand years are completed. After these things, he must be released for a short time. Okay, shutting him up tells us that he's powerless. Because he's powerless, those he directs are powerless also. His demons are also powerless during the time of the Millennial Kingdom. They're not going to be doing his work for him in his place. Uh, they probably are just spinning and wherever. Oh, okay, okay, okay. The um, Under the water, remember when we talked and read through the desolation of Babylon and it talked about the, the waters? Remember Babylon even it's, it seems submerged under the waters? That's where we get the idea that this is where the demons are also. Because when you go back into Yeshia, Isaiah 34, and you read the description of the Babylonian destruction that's never taken place yet the way God says it will be, then we also read, and some of the language you have to understand because they used uh, metaphors when it talked about the great horny, horny owl, I think it says in Isaiah 34 about verse 6, that was a euphemism given to like a demon. So it was saying that these demons were bound in Babylon now, that they would not be released. Remember, Babylon was the face of evil, a false religion of all time. A false religion is worshiping anything other than the Lord, and we know the worship was going to Satan. We saw that all the way through Scripture. We saw the way it evolved, and we see it in its wholeness. And it's it's demon-driven. 
So those demons are confined with the destruction of Babylon also. We've got some confined under the pit before that. We've got those now during that time. Babylon's never going to be rebuilt. They are confined there. They're not allowed to go through the face of the earth and cause trouble. Okay, so they wander in desolate Babylon. Um, and again, because their chief opponent, their, I mean their chief ruler, <coughs> the opponent of the Messiah, is, is confined and powerless, they're powerless. Uh, the same way I see that God says when you strike the shepherd, the, the sheep scatter, the same idea like that. Their leader is gone and they're, they're not any good apart from their leader. Okay? Now, it says that the, they were shut and sealed, or the abyss was shut and sealed. Okay? <coughs> Why sealed? What are we seeing? What does a seal mean? Well, when we look at it in Scripture, what God puts a seal on, no one can break it. As recently as our 144,000, we see them sealed on their foreheads the name of God. They belong to God. Remember, they're able to go out and evangelize throughout the ends of the earth. No one can stop them. Okay, they're, they're mm -hmm. better than Superman because yeah. kryptonite brings him down. <laughs> so in the seal of God, they can't be touched until God says their job is done and releases that seal. We don't read about that with the 144,000, but the two witnesses, when they are evangelizing, when they are doing their work, they're able to go freely throughout also, but then there is the point where they are killed. That's because God has allowed it, not because God went, oops, uh-oh, I got a problem. No, because it was part of God's plan. And what happens with those two witnesses who the whole world is rejoicing, I think the same way Satan rejoiced when when um, Yeshua had died on the cross, their bodies are laying in the street. They won't even let them be buried. They're showing them on Channel 7, CNN. <laughs> you know, you got all the news media there. And I love it because they're right there. I'd give anything to see their faces because all of a sudden these two witnesses come to life and get taken right up into heaven, live and in living color for the whole world to see with satellite TV, with our little smartphones that we see what's happening on the streets of Jerusalem today. They're going to see it happen, and wow, what a testimony. Why that doesn't turn people to the Lord, I don't get it. The same way I don't get when God, when the Lord, I'm sorry, when Yeshua Jesus was in the garden, and the, the um, soldiers came to capture him, to take him, you know, and they get this whole legion of, of soldiers to take him. What a laugh. You know, if he didn't want to be taken, you could have the whole world, and he couldn't be taken. And yet, this part of his plan. But when he's asked who he is, just by virtue of him saying, I am, they all found their two clothes. You know, when they were giving gifts to each other because they, they celebrate, you know, they, they're, you're going to see that the faces, they were smiling all the time, they see these two witnesses like, <laughs> Exactly, the terror that's going to rip a hold of their souls. But it shows you how heart and that heart is against God, that they don't turn to God at that point. And all the way through with all these plagues and everything that's falling and at that one point, very, very closely in, remember where we read that they turn and blaspheme God? Mm -hmm. Instead of crying out, oh, Lord, God have mercy, they blaspheme him. Mm -hmm. Thank God we're not apart. Mm -hmm. Let me bring you to our seal. <clears throat> Do you know where you read about our seal? Do you know where to turn in scripture? You need to know your addresses. You need to know where you belong. Amen. You know who you want. You know who you belong to. But do you know where he tells you he sealed you? I heard somebody over here. Ephesians. Very good. Go with me to Ephesians one. We're going to look at verse thirteen and verse fourteen real quickly. Ephesians one thirteen says, "In him, in Yeshua, in the Lord Jesus, you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation." It's clear. Who is he talking about? Uh, He's talking about saved people, those who believe the gospel, who believe the message of salvation, having also believed, since you believe, you were sealed in him. And how were you sealed? With the Holy Spirit of promise. What does that mean? That the Holy Spirit is your guarantee of the promise that you are saved. Let's read verse 14. I'll give you the explanation fully. Who is given as a pledge of our inheritance 
with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. And hallelujah, I gotta let it out again. Hallelujah, because what that is saying is the Holy Spirit is our pledge that we will inherit inherit salvation because that is what we've been promised. It's going to be our possession. In other words, really right now we don't have it because we're still living here on this earth in our earthly form and our earthly form, if God tarries so long, we'll, we'll die. We'll shed this, this um, yeah, this body, this shell. You know, we'll, we'll shed the shell. <laughs> when we come up, our soul comes up into heaven. We're allowed into the presence of heaven because of the shed blood that was placed there by Messiah Yeshua Jesus for us to come into our possession. That's where we gain our eternal life. We're not going to live forever here, confined to this earth and in this body, thank God, because of all of the evil and all that, that's down here. I don't want to live here forever. But this is our guarantee, and our guarantee is the Holy Spirit. When he came down and we saw him come into each of those Talmudim in the beginning, we don't see it in that way. Now when someone accepts the Lord into their heart, we don't see a visible tongue of fire on their head. But the same thing has happened. The Holy Spirit has come within them. You have a part of God living in you. How does he do that? He's God. Don't ask me to explain it because... He's God. <laughs> but he said, I want you to know it's guaranteed. You ever heard of a 100% back money guarantee? You ever hear, hear guarantee? And with man, sometimes the guarantee doesn't prove to be true. But God never lies. Who lies? Satan. Yes, but God never lies. And in the Greek, when it says that, that you're sealed it's the same word that they use for an engagement okay. ring. Mm -hmm. When the ring was slipped onto the finger in Bible times, in engagement, it was as good as marrying. Now, they hadn't collected on the marriage yet. There has to be a time, a ceremony, and then they're wedded. We are still looking forward to our wedding, to the marriage feast with our bridegroom, but we know we're his bride. And if that bride and groom, pre-bride, pre-groom, if they wanted to defect from that proposal, they had to get a bill of divorcement. Today we don't do that. Take off engagement ring, give it back, and you go on your merry way. But back then, it was as good as if they had had that ceremony. That's what God's saying. You are mine, or I should say what Yeshua Jesus is saying, because yes. he is our bridegroom. Yeah. We are his bride. He is saying, the Holy Spirit's your engagement ring. He is your guarantee. If we're to break this, it would take a bill of divorcement. You know the Lord does not break his word. He's not going to break it. We can't break it either. We don't have the power to break it, because we'd be stronger than the Spirit then. We can't break it either. We are sealed. Just like those 144,000, they can shoot at them, bing, 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 and load their whole rifle, get the semi-automatics, do whatever they want. They can come at him with the guillotine. They can do anything they think that they can do. That one isn't going to die. Not because he's sealed. God will not let it happen. God doesn't lose one. The Lord even says, all who the Father have given me, I will lose none. When you are in salvation, you are in the hand of the Lord, and his hand is in the hand of God, and you are doubly safe. And like someone said, the most you might be able to do when you rebel is jump from a knuckle to another knuckle. And don't be a knucklehead. <laughs> Stay in safe, appreciate, and keep in right relationship, and enjoy being sealed Amen. and in the power of the Spirit do your life. So, we're sealed. This seal it intimates also that the judicial and governing authority has pledged itself to retain in secure custody this prisoner. The, the judicial heavens led by the judge, whether you say the Lord or whether you say God, they're one and the same and they're both judging they have deemed this Satan will be sealed 
in that pit, you have their authority on it. No worries, no problems, we can move on. Um, let me take you real quickly. Uh, the, let me take you to both. Let's go to Daniel, Daniel chapter 6 and verse 16, because I want you to see how binding a seal is. Okay, I've told you God's seal, let me even show you it with man. Daniel 6, and I think you probably know this chapter well. Daniel 6, verse 16. One of my favorite chapters. We're jumping into Daniel's life, man of Daniel 6, man of prayer, man of prophecy, and purpose. Yay, my Daniel students. Okay. Then the king gave orders, and Daniel was brought and cast into the lion's den. He's close to 90 probably at this point. He's not a little 20-year-old that's really strong and can even handle being cast down into the pit. But here he's cast down in, and the king said to, to Daniel, Your God, whom you constantly serve, will himself deliver you. Now, I think the king was hoping this. Your God, who you say is so great, he's going to take care of you. The reason why I say I think he's only hoping is because we find out Daniel didn't lose any sleep that night. He had a soft, furry pillow. <laughs> he slept just fine. I think he probably enjoyed himself down there. Who lost sleep that night? <laughs> the king. <laughs> Pacing all night, didn't sleep, and hits that, that, that pit in the morning and opens that seal. Daniel, was your God able to save you? And I'm sure he's shaking, waiting to hear a voice come back. Oh, King. Susie heard that. He knew he was alive. I love this. But notice when he the he put him, or he, you know, he's been cast into the lion's den. Verse 17. A stone was brought, laid over the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the signet rings of his nobles so that nothing would be changed in regard to Daniel. I think that was at those cohort, cohorts of, um, of the king, those nobles that brought the charges against Daniel. They added their signet too. Nobody could break the king's signet. When we see Esther, that the decree went out for the Jewish people to be killed, it's made very clear. The king could not reverse it. He couldn't take it back and say, it doesn't happen. But what he could do is he could say the Jews were allowed to defend themselves, give them the weaponry to defend themselves, and, and warn people you come against them, it'll be your demise. But he couldn't change it. He couldn't revoke it. That's what we're seeing here. The seal is showing it was irrevocable. Now, because of where we just came through, because we just hit our very special Sunday, let's relish in it one more time and go with me to Matthew. And Matthew, we're going to go to chapter 27. Matthew was writing to a Jewish audience. He was writing um, the acts of the Messiah when he lived here on this earth in what we call his first coming. In Matthew chapter 27 and verse 62. We read, um, well, let me tell you, um, let me tell you through verse 61, you have that Yeshua Jesus has died. He's been taken down off of the cross, and his body has been placed in the tomb, okay? Um, and the stone against the entrance of the tomb was rolled in verse 60. Mary Magdalene was there, the other Mary sitting opposite the grave. They see him put in the tomb, and they see the stone rolled. And by the way, that stone was huge. That's why when the women are going to the tomb later to put uh, spices on the body of Yeshua Jesus, they're saying, we wonder who will roll away the stone for us. We saw in the garden, um, when we were there in Israel, we, they showed us a picture of a stone that was, they said, maybe one-fourth of the size of the stone it would have taken to cover the opening. And it took six men to carry that stone into the garden to put it there for us. So this, this is huge. This is permanent, and a seal has been put on it, okay? Because the next day, verse 62, the day after the preparation, the chief priests Pharisees gathered together with Pilate and said, Sir, we remember that when he was still alive, that the Savior said, After three days I am to rise again. Still not believing him. Calling Yeshua Jesus a deceiver. Okay? 
Verse 64, therefore, give orders for the grave to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples, his Talmudim, may come, steal him away, and say to the people, he's risen from the dead. And that last deception would be worse than the first. Did they know the truth and yet believe it to be a lie? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. They were calling him out. Oh, he said that he's going to raise on the third day. They even got it. Oh, yeah. They even yeah. caught it. So let's put our seal on it. Nobody can break that seal. That's a guarantee that his Talmud, even they can't come and steal him away in the dark of night. Hide him away and then say, see, he's risen. So they seal that too. Think that can keep God in? Or Yeshua Jesus. Look at verse 66. They went and made the grave secure, and along with the guard, they set a seal on the stone. Okay? No one can tamper with that seal. You've got the stone, you've got the seal, and you've got the guards. And what happens? <laughs> Hallelujah. He resurrects. He's out of that tomb. And he sends an earthquake that the stone is rolled away, whether it's by the earthquake or by the angelic power. The angels are there to show into the tomb that it is empty. The stone was not rolled away to let him out. The stone was rolled away to show he was already out. He is risen. Hallelujah. So they sealed thinking this is it. Nobody can break this. This is the kingly seal. God has his own seal also. And when he puts his seal on it, it does last, okay? So why is, there, is, is it that he's sealed? What's so important to know? Why is it critical that he's sealed during this time of millennium? Because we see it going back to Revelation 20, and what are we in verse 3? We see in verse 3 that it says, uh, okay, he was sealed so that he would not deceive the nations any longer. Here's my proof positive, okay? For the first time since Adam and Eve, there is no tempter who is going to deceive that will do the work that he had done in the Garden of Eden. So all the way back from here, we've had a deceiver at work until here he is finally under the earth, in that pit, unable to deceive. That's sealed. Nothing's going to happen, okay? But then we are told, after the thousand years, and I'm looking here at verse 3, still in verse 3 in the middle, until the thousand years were completed. I think that's our third time. We're going to get to six, remember. After these things, he must be released for a short time, or you might have something that says for a little season, okay? Now, um, this is going to, going to be a, the time of the last testing of mankind. From the beginning, man has been tested in different ways through different times to see if he puts his faith in the Lord, if he is obedient to the Lord, or if he disobeys the Lord. Okay, Adam and Eve, it was very simple. It was just, they, they were innocent. And they, in their innocence, buy the deception and they fall. We have a time of conscience when man went by their conscience and we're told every thought was only evil continually. God gave them promise. And with Abraham, I'm promising you. And we saw how it wasn't just to be a big nation, but the promise of the coming Redeemer. How many are saved during that time? They don't make it. They don't make it. Even Abraham sinned. He had his promise, and yet he made mistakes. That's why we've got an issue and a whole lot of contention. Okay? <laughs> we come into the time of law. They're given a standard. How clear can you get it? If they want to stand before God and say, well, if you had just laid down the law, if you had just said, do this, don't do this, I would have kept it, I could have done it, and I would be okay before you today. And God will point to that time of law and say, find me one person who kept the law perfectly. And the only one they'll find is Yeshua Jesus. He was the only one able. Okay, so different tests, different ways, different times. We're in the time called the church. We're in the period of grace. All we have to do is, by faith, accept the free gift. And how many aren't doing it? How simple could the Lord make it? And they're still missing it. Now, during this time, as we're coming, we're coming past the tribulation, and during this time, because of people living on earth, and we're going to go into who they are, because of them not having the tempter, 
they still have to be obedient. The Lord is going to rule and reign. He says that he rules with a rod of iron. Remember Ananias and Sapphira when they lied to the Holy Spirit? They were cut down. Their dead bodies were carried out. That's a taste when the Lord is judging with a rod of iron what it is like. Now, in foreign countries where if you caught stealing off with your hand, how much theft goes on in that country? Next to nothing. One person got their hand taken off, everybody counts out. Okay, so in the millennial, without the, the deceiver, they have the Lord sitting on the throne, hears his rule, they see swift and right judgment, nothing unfair, nothing wrong, but they see that judgment. Now they're going to abide. Wow, I'm not going to stick my foot over that line because I see what will happen. But in their heart, they're not doing it because they love the Lord and they want to be in obedience to Him. They're doing it to save their own skin, so to speak. They're doing it just because they have to. It's, it's the little child that was told repeatedly, sit down, sit down, sit down, and finally sits down out of force and says to his mother, well, I'm sitting down on the outside, but I'm standing up on the inside. <laughs> well, that's what some will do, even during the millennial, even being in the presence of the Lord judging fairly. And he has us judging with him. Remember, we will rule and reign with him. So judgment goes on throughout the face of the earth so that things are fair. Okay, because we live in still a, a time of imperfection. The, even though the deceiver isn't there to sin, the people are still born with human nature. Human nature is sinful. So they can still do wrong. So you're going to need wise judges like Shlomo, Salman, who has two moms coming and fighting over whose baby it is. And how smart was he? Okay, well, let's just cut the baby in half. Who's going to holler? The real mom. No, no, no. Spare the baby's life. Give it to the other. Well, okay, then you're the mom. That was wise. Amen. His wisdom came from God. The Lord is going to be ruling in that kind of wisdom, and people will see and they'll stay in line because they have to, to save their own neck. But once they're given an opportunity to show what's in their heart, that's what we're going to find. Satan is loose for a little season. It's represented here. It's called Gog and Magog. We'll get into that as soon as we get to verse 5, I think it is. We'll talk about what the name means. But they're given an opportunity to show what's in their heart. Because no one is forced into the camp of the Lord. No one is forced. It is free will. Okay, so uh, because Satan's going to have to be released for this time, to give that test to, to, for mankind to pass or fail that test, that is why he is not at this point cast into the lake of fire forever. Because God still is going to use him. There is still a purpose for him. Once he goes in the lake of fire, no one, nothing, demon, human, nothing ever comes out of the lake of fire. So had he been cast in like a fire, he could not be released for this testing to go on during this time. <coughs> so at this point, when he's put into the abyss, the false prophet and the Antichrist, remember where they ended up? In the fire. In the fire. They got a straight ticket, free ticket, straight into hell. <coughs> and we're going to see they're still there when this thousand years has ended, which does away with the thought of annihilation. How come they don't burn? Sorry. Because it's not the type of fire here that consumes the flesh. Right. It's the soul that is burning forever. And the soul is the God breathed in a man, man became a living being. That cannot die. God cannot die. It goes on forever. Whether they get to, to have forever in his presence or whether they suffer forever is the choice that's made. But, um, the fire that burns is an analogy for us to understand. That we call the lake of fire, it is some type of fire, but it is not like our human fire that this, they would burn up. They'd, they'd be ashes and that's it. It'd be annihilation, it would be gone. And there are those who want to believe that, who say, well, God's too loving. He wouldn't put someone through an eternity of torture. Well, he didn't put them there. They chose it for themselves. And that's what you have to realize, that, that it's not a God being mean. But this enemy of the Lord has chosen to reject him. That God has done everything. He stopped at nothing short. He came from heaven. He bankrupted heaven, they say. 
you know what we mean, but came down to earth to give his life, and they trample on his blood. If they do that, how can they be saved? That's what Hebrews says. Don't go past this safe harbor. Don't trample underfoot the blood. Don't go back to the blood of bulls and goats. It can't save you. If you turn away from this blood, there's nothing to save you. But who does it? They do it. Each one individually chooses it for themselves. No one is forced into help. They choose it by rejection. There really is no middle road. You are either in the Lord's camp or you are in Satan's camp. There is no in-between. To not choose him is to reject him. Now, if you're in this camp, you may not have made a final rejection. You can still turn and join the Lord in his camp. You're not, oh, well, this was my lot in life and I didn't have a chance. No, no. God's always given you that free will. And when I'm saying to you, I'm talking in general, you know that. God's always given that free will. Any who want to be saved can be and will be, I guarantee you. God is not willing that any should perish. For God so loved the world. He didn't say, I love the rich. I love the good. I love the pretty. I love the homeless. <laughs> good, bad, indifferent. Rich, poor, male, female, you know, name it all. My mind can't cover it all. Whatever he put there, he didn't put any stigma in there. He didn't put any limitation in there. Are you part of the world? Is there any human that is not part of the world? No. So it's for every human. They have to choose to reject. And when they make that final rejection, and only God can judge that, and for the majority, I believe that final rejection isn't even until the last moments of their life. But once that final rejection is made, they have sealed their fate. But we are never to judge that. Where there is life, there is hope. I don't care if someone's on their deathbed with their last breath. If you have an opportunity to witness to them, take it. Because at those moments when they really are realizing this life is about over, and hopefully they're scared to death because they don't know what's going to happen next. It's a prime time to get in there with the gospel and say, for God so loved. Wow. Michelle, what I think of fire is, is the emo this is what I'm thinking, it's the emotional pain that we can't really describe, but it's the emotional pain that we're away from God. And that's the fire that I feel that that's what it is. The person that that will that torment. It's not a burning fire like we we know, but it's that emotional, inner soul feeling of being away from God. But it also talks descriptively of this sulfur and this. Yeah. We'll get into that. That's why people also put the reality on it. Fire. You know, yeah. I think it is a fire that burns that doesn't consume. And yes, I agree with you. The greater torture is realizing they're part of the love of God forever. That's why we got to get the message out, people. Sure. You know, I wonder what that's going to be like. You live in a thousand years of wonderful without Satan here on earth. Now, all of a sudden, He's released. Mm -hmm. And I wonder what that's going to be like. All of a sudden, things start to go bad. I don't think it's that they'll go bad. Um, let me intercept. I shouldn't cut you off. But I think what it is, is very quickly, he is going to show himself the way he feels he is. I'm, I'm God. You need to worship me. He'll make himself look like an angel of light to them. And he'll draw them, you know, those who you haven't liked the way you had to obey because, you, you know, you, you were forced to be obedient. Well, come follow me and find out how nice it is under me. You know, he'll, he'll lie to them. So he'll be visible see them. to see? Yes, yes. They will see him. It won't be the way he's working now. True, true. He won't come in your mind and he won't come well, and may do that also. But he will, they'll literally see and they literally will follow and literally you will see the demise of him. We will get into that. Why bring him back? So it kind of mirrors Genesis where in the garden they were not scared of him. He looks like an angel of light. So. And, and I'm sure he's going to make himself enticing once again. Right. Yes. So yeah, it kind of does mirror what he did in the garden of Eden. 
Why, Karen? Because like we said, they, the people who lived during that thousand years need that opportunity to show whether they are with the Lord or not for their heart to be revealed, to make a choice. They've been told about the Lord. They've been told about His love. They've done the sacrifices that pointed toward what the Lord had done. They should know the high cost of, of their salvation. It's all there for them. They have that head knowledge, but they have to decide in their heart, do they want allegiance to the Lord or do they want allegiance toward the enemy? And so they're given that chance to show what's really in their heart because otherwise, the Lord, if he came to them at the end of a thousand years and said, well, you go to hell and you go to heaven, why? Why did you choose hell for me, God? See, but no, he's going to allow them to show what's in their heart. And then they'll stand before him in judgment. Go ahead. I think uh, you, you forget that they have still have a sin nature. Yes, they still have that sin nature. Thank you. Let me make that very clear. We're all born with a sin nature, and the humans that go into, um, and because we're not getting as far as fast as I wanted, at the start of the millennium, and we will go into this, Matthew 25 tells us there's a sheep and goat judgment. The sheep are put on his right hand, and the, uh, the Lord's right hand, and he says for them to go into the kingdom. The goats are cast out, okay? There's a judgment there. The ones who go into the kingdom are the believers, the ones who have believed in the Lamb of God. They were born during the tribulation period, whatever. It was salvation for them came after the rapture. They could be adults during this time. Don't let me just say children, because anyone who is hearing but has not made that final rejection and I trust a number of those who we're witnessing to right now, if the rapture occurred in the middle of this class and we're gone, they're going to say, you know what? They told me about this. I do believe it now. And they're going to get into the Word of God, and they will ask the Lord into their heart for salvation. Now, unfortunately, they've missed the rapture, but they can live out through those, those seven years, possibly. The great majority of them will be beheaded. The great majority of them will suffer persecution for their faith. But there will be some that are able to hide out, who take food and go into a cave or whatever and are able to make it through that time. There are those that God allows to flee. We believe to Petra. Remember we talked about that? And he puts his hand of protection on them. Then he brings them back at the end of the, uh, the tribulation time when he's setting up his kingdom. And they are the ones who believed in him, so they're going to be the sheep and they're going to go into this kingdom. Okay, so you've got... People who are adults who go into the kingdom. You have people of all ages. But I'm taking you to the adults because the adults are going to do what God intended for Adam and Eve to do back in the beginning. Fill the face of the earth. So they're going to get married and they're going to have babies. Those babies are born with a sin nature because they're still born to human beings that have gone into the kingdom. Those human beings were not resurrected. They were not raptured. They didn't get a change in their body. They didn't go from mortal to immortal. Did I say that right? I think yeah. I did. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> the last time I didn't. Yeah. They, they, they haven't changed. We who were caught up in the rapture know that we put on our immorality, immortality. <laughs> we, know, God forgive me. we know that we live forever in that state. We're not, we're not bound by gravity. We're not confined. We're not, we don't cut and bleed. We don't have to eat and sleep and do all the things that you have to do. But those human beings that lived out the tribulation, that stood, that, that were, are, were represented by the sheep, that the Lord said, go into my kingdom, they still have their human body. They're going to conceive in their human body. They're going to give birth to a little human being. That little human being is going to have its own will. <laughs> so even though Satan's not at that one, look at a baby. How long does it take for you to see selfishness in a baby? <laughs> yeah. By the time they can talk, it's mine. <laughs> But you even see it in their attitudes before they can talk. Do you not? We all know it. Anybody who's had a baby, very demanding, very self-centered, very mind, you know, and I want it this way. I mean, at one moment, there's that precious little buckle, and the next moment, <laughs> they're showing there's another side in them. So that is what we're talking about. That's what will be controlled by the rule of law that, by, I don't want to call it a law, the rod of iron. 
okay? Again, they're going to stay in line because they have to. You see that in a home where, where the parental authority is very strict, you see the kids toe the line, but when they're given a chance to do their own thing, usually they really rebel, you know, because it wasn't in their heart. They weren't dealt with in a way that, that caused their heart to want to stay in line. They were just forced to stay in line. So those those young ones that were born during the tribulation, sorry, during the millennial time, if they don't outwardly sin, they keep that rebellion in their heart, they can live out the thousand years. It says that a child will die at a hundred, an old man will die at a thousand years. So in essence, what we're being told is life goes on long like it did before the flood. Remember, Methuselah died at 969 years. That's almost the whole millennium. So these people are not going to be under the same violet, ultraviolet rays or whatever that, that age us. They're going to have that ability to live out. But, again, if they sin, life may be taken from them. Death will be there. They'll understand that. But now, at this time, they're going to get that chance to show whether they were obedient because they had the heart to obey or whether they were obedient out of force. During the millennial period, the people still need to read the scriptures. Yes. The scriptures will be yes. They'll need the to read the scriptures. They'll need to make the sacrifices. They have to come up to the temple for the pilgrimages three times a year. That's Passover, that's uh, Shavuot, and that's Sukkot. Passover and Shavuot, we're right there now. We know Passover, Shavuot is first fruits. Um, and then we know that it's Sukkot in the fall is when they, they dwell in the booths that show how God um, supplied for the people. So they're going to be coming up. They're also going to be coming up and bringing their uh, first fruits of their crops. They're going to be bringing in offerings. They're going to make sacrifices again. And you say, well, why? Because it shows them what the Lord did. It's an object lesson. They'll understand because they won't see death and understand death apart from something like yeah. that. So how do you explain it? Well, I heard testimony of a woman as an adult. She was full of life, a little wild one. <laughs> At six years of age, she heard her, I think it was her mom say to her aunt, you know, that child's not going to live to her sixth birthday. <laughs> Meaning it facetiously because she was just wild and always getting into trouble. Well, she wondered what that meant. And a little while after hearing that, her little pet turtle died. It didn't come out of the shell. Suddenly, she understood death, and it scared the living daylights out of her. I'm not going to live to be six. I'm going to die, and it scared her. God used it to get her saved, so that's a good ending. But the people living during this time, if they weren't dealing with something hands-on to show them, would not understand. So God is allowing them to see how costly, to understand, to appreciate. Why do we love the Lord? None of us love it because we were born and decided, oh, I just want to love the one who made me. None of us. We were drawn by the Holy Spirit. And what went us over? What he did for us. Amen. Wow. When you're taught that he gave his life for you, you love him. You respond to that because he did it. When they see a sacrifice animal and realize that animal gave its life, oh, that's what the Lord did for me. That should draw their heart to love him, to want to serve him, to want to please him. But unfortunately, just like today, I don't get it. Thank God I don't get it because I'm not one of them. But there are those who don't love the Lord, even though they've heard it. They harden our heart against it, the same way Pharaoh hardened his heart against, let my people go. And when it says God hardened Pharaoh's heart, it's not mean and cruel. It's not that God didn't give Pharaoh a choice. If you take wax and you take clay and you put them both in the sunlight, one hardens and one melts. God hardened Pharaoh's heart by the light he gave Pharaoh. And Pharaoh is the one who hardened his own heart too. That clay, that that wax hopefully is us. When we are in the light, we melt before the Lord. That's what we want. But they have to choose for themselves. Every single individual ever born. Question, Michelle. A thousand years, is that like the, the, the amount of 
years that we count as here on earth or is it a different yeah. I believe it's still the earthly years. years. I believe it's earthly years because it's been given to us in that vernacular. The same way that we say Daniel's 70th week is a seven year period because we take it from all of the other weeks, the time that they were, and we see it, we understand. And actually, um, um, okay, is it is day and month? No, 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 I'm sorry. I don't want to say it wrong. It's in my notes. I should wait till it comes in my notes. Um, there are certain words in Scripture that are symbolic and certain words that are not, and I'm not finding it real quick. Um, the day is symbolic because we know a day can be a thousand days. It can be a thousand years. I believe it's month that is never anything but a month. And... I want to say year. Why can't I find it in my notes? I studied it for today. <laughs> I just don't remember everything I said. Um, okay, it, it'll come up. It's I know right where it is, and that's why I'm looking through my notes to see. But it will come. Uh, and I'll show you. Daniel 9, 27 is what I'm talking about for the 70th week, yes. Yeah. Ashley verses 24 to 27, but I'm not finding it. I'm just trying too hard, I guess. You see the days are evil. It does not mean 24 hours. Right. Okay, here it is. Here it is. I passed it already. Yes. The term day and hour is used in the Bible in other than the literal sense. Like, what were you just saying? Because you were right. The days are evil. The days are evil, okay? And that's not meaning, I mean, that could be two days, or it can be a hundred days. It can be, you know, longer. The days are evil. It's referring to time period. The day of the Lord, we know, is not one literal 24-hour day, okay? So day in Scripture, and the hour, is the hour of his, um, what's the word? Ah. Uh, Temptation. Wasn't it the hour of his temptation? Okay. It happened at a specific time. Okay, is what it's saying. It didn't mean literally it was 60 minutes long. It meant that it's now come upon us. Okay? But when month is used in Scripture, or year is used in Scripture, we never see them mean anything other than the literal. When it talks about 42 months, we know it's 1260 days. That day could be something different, but because it's tied to 42 months, and it's also tied to the other expression, time, times, and half a time, which we know is a year, two years, and a half a year. One plus two plus a half is three and a half years. Yeah. Then we know that 42 months is literal months, and that 1260 days is literal days. But again, in other places in Scripture, days will mean other things, but months and years always seem to mean exactly what they're saying. Yes, month and years are the two that we seem to always be able to take literally. Now, if you come up with a, a, an exception to that, I'm open. You know, but from my study going through my mind, yeah. after I read this in the source, I think it, I, I didn't come up with an exception. So, yes, Judy. Is everybody going to have an opportunity to know the Lord? Yes, because he's going to be sitting on his throne, ruling and reigning. They're going to know he is God on earth. Remember the prayer, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So yes, he will rule. He will rule fair. He will rule justly. It's not that you're going to have the jungles where they don't hear and don't know. No, this the whole face of the earth will be under his jurisdiction. And they will all be able to know. They will all be able to hear and understand what we know as the gospel message. Yes. Yeah. Loud and clear. Sherry? Okay, the thousand years is over, and Satan has been bound. Those who have decided to go with Satan have gone to Satan. Those who have decided not to, okay. What happens to the people now that have decided to stay with Jesus? Are they? Is that the end of the world? He takes them to heaven, and that's it? That's when we're going to go into eternity future, and we'll answer questions specifically with it. We'll see what their future is, because I do believe that we do have <coughs> clues to their future. We have clues to our future. Do we know it all? No. Yeah, there will be a time when I think God's going to have to roll out a whole new map <laughs> you know, and tell us. But it's what we call eternity future. Mm -hmm. And we'll get to that as we do get to there. But, um, but yes, there is a, a future plan for them. The ones who chose not to are in the lake of fire forever. They will stand at the great white throne judgment for their judgment. And then they'll be cast in the lake of fire forever. Ruth. So the people that go up. Uh, that are taken up during the tribulations will not be mingled with the people who are living a thousand years on earth. Okay, I'm not sure which two groups you're meaning. Okay, the people who were taken up 
with the rapture. In the rapture. And they go up to heaven. Okay. We'll never mingle with the thousand year over people. Years. We will rule we will over them. Over. We will we rule and we'll reign over, over them. them. We will not live on earth, confined to earth like they are. We, uh, we won't have to sleep. We won't have to eat. We get to eat. We get to eat. The Lord ate in his resurrected body. He ate. We're told about the tree that has different fruit continually in heaven. We get to eat. But you don't eat because you have to. You eat because you want to. Um, but but we have the people the people the raptured the people raptured have that immortality. Okay? They are no longer susceptible to death. They are in their new body. Everything's glorious. They don't age. They don't hurt. They don't suffer. It's all wonderful. The earthbound people will still know suffering. They'll still know pain. They'll still know death. If someone steps out of line, they'll see it. They'll know it. We rule and reign over them. When God says, Ruth, I need you to go take care of that city. Where, you know, maybe you'll get a whole state. So we'll be influencing the people. Yes, yes. Okay. We will have influence over them. We'll be able to tell them what it was like on this side. Mm -hmm. We'll be able to tell them, you don't know how good you've got it. Yes. The adversary who went after us, he's in the pit. <laughs> what happened to the people that did take the mark of the beast at this time? Okay, the ones who take the mark of the beast we know are condemned. We know that they do not, they can never get saved. So they will end up standing before God at the great white throne judgment. You know, for their judgment, where they are during this time, there, I, there must be like a holding area, just like the the suffering side of Sheol is still there. They must be contained there also, because they're not running around loose and free during this millennial time either. You know, remember he comes back and he slays. So many of them, I think, will have gone to their death, or they will be put in that holding tank waiting the day of judgment. And at that time, they can't change their minds. No, and say, no, 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 Yeah. When we leave this earth through death, it's sealed. We don't get a second chance. When the Lord has come back, and they were the enemy of the Lord, in that point, cut off right there at that point, it sealed their fate forever also. They wouldn't turn if they could. If they were going to, they would have. They would have. Dora, did you have your hand up? Oh, well, I, I was going to ask, I mean, but we're not going to be able to kind of have a relationship with the people because... Not a human type relationship, no, no. We won't do the, the human things. We're not going to get married and have families and no, all of that. No, I mean with the people in, 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 in the millennium. Yeah. Right, right, no. We won't have that kind of relationship. We'll be, yeah. we'll be above them as their judges. We get a little taste <clears throat> of what it can be like for us in the way Philip was suddenly taken and deposited somewhere else. The Lord wants us somewhere, boom, we're there. We're not going to have to get in a car or get in a plane or a boat or a train. We don't have to pack. And we don't have to pack. We're carrying the luggage. The question I have is, so um, supposing this happens tomorrow, okay? Praise God. God. We say no. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I know you're saying how important it is to know what's going to happen when it happens, mm -hmm. yeah. and so that you know what to do. Mm -hmm. Okay. For those of us who don't have that down pat, okay, you know, understand what I'm saying? Who don't know exactly from A to B to C to D to E, okay? We maybe know from A to to F. Oh, with all the all the on ones and things in between, we're not sure about. Okay. Who is going to help us? I mean, who is going to, how are we going to know the right thing to do? Okay, now, the right time? are you meaning on this side of the rapture? Yes. Okay, this side of the on this side of the rapture, right. the only thing we need to do to go in that rapture is to ask the Lord personally into our heart for salvation, to believe in the Lord and his death, burial, and resurrection, his sinless blood in our place. That gives us that Holy Spirit who put his it is sealed on us and we belong to him we don't do anything to earn 
our right to heaven, we do everything by accepting the free gift. Okay, Ephesians 2, 8, 9 is a free gift, not a works, lest any man should boast. Okay, so there's nothing else that you do to earn going up in a rapture, but you should be living a life for him. You should be active in your work for him. Uh, there are those... I'm walking a fine line. There are those that I mingle with. <laughs> you can understand that. You can read between the lines. Who are of the opinion that if you're not in the right state, not in a right relationship with the Lord, you're backslidden at the time of rapture that you won't go. Okay, now, I'm not one who believes that, but there are those who do believe that. So they will tell you, you've got to be doing this, you've got to be doing that, you've got to be doing the other thing. Okay? There's a whole lot of reason why I can argue with them, but everybody gets to decide what they want, and the Lord will do what he knows, what he put into motion. But my understanding is to go in the rapture is dependent solely on your relationship of accepting or rejecting. Yeah. Now, if you're on that, so to speak, fence, you're right here, the rapture occurs tomorrow, and you had not made up your mind that you wanted the Lord as your Savior, you missed the rapture then. You weren't sealed with the Holy Spirit. But you were being drawn. You had made a final rejection, and now you're like, whoa, I wish I had. I didn't, but thank God it's not too late for me. I still accept him right now. And I'm sealed by the, the, the Holy Spirit in the way that I'm guaranteed when I leave this earth, I will also get heaven. The difference is the Holy Spirit's not going to indwell those people during the, the tribulation full time. He will come on them to do a work for him, and then he'll, he'll um, leave them, so to speak, the way it was before this time. That's why you have David... Pray, oh Lord, don't take your spirit from me. And that's why you have Samson know when the spirit of God was on him, the power of God to do the act. That's why in the tribulation time, because it's not in the seal of the time, in the tribulation time, why the 144,000 have to be sealed. Otherwise, why do they need another seal? If they've already got the seal of the Holy Spirit, why do they need to be sealed again? Sorry, I know you do. You two said you had to go. We're, we're trying to close. I'm just trying to get the questions that are on the table. And they will come back up next week, too. Roger, you are next. You've been trying for a while. But, but the Holy Spirit never leaves this earth in totality. When the earth was being formed for us, his spirit hovered over the face of the earth. We read that, Genesis 1, 2. The spirit's always been active. It's just in a different way. During this time, we're really spoiled with what we get. We really are. We're privileged. Those before and after will still have the spirit come on them. They can't even get saved without the spirit drawing them. Because we know that. It says none would come to the Father but the spirit draw them. So the spirit's still going to be working but in a different way. And so, and why, what was your, oh, uh, originally. So, um, if they accept the Lord after the rapture, they're going to live through the horrors of the tribulation, probably get beheaded during that time for their faith. The majority will. There will be the few who live out. But they, when they leave this earth, they will also have um, heaven as their eternal home. So, even those that... Um, during the tribulation period, lose their life, we see them under the throne. Remember, the souls were under the throne. How long, how long until you avenge our blood? See, they gained heaven. They didn't miss out on heaven. They just didn't get to go in rapture, and they had to live through whatever they had to live through. Okay? And in on the hard way, yeah. Yeah, the hard way. Yes, yes. Roger, your question real quick, because yeah. I know we're running out of time. Uh, probably for the beginning of time, God put everybody's name in a book. And everybody's name's in there. And it never gets taken out until you die. When you die and you have not rejected or accepted Christ, if you've rejected him and never accepted him, then your name's blotted out. Even that, even all the way up to the um, past the millennium. For the last when he does a the great white throne judgment comes in, if your name's not in the book, or it's been blotted out of the book, I should say it's blotted out of the book, then you go ahead. Right. 
and when they make that final rejection is when the name is blotted out. So for some who make a final rejection before they leave this earth, that's the only exception I'd say to what you said, their name could be blotted out before they physically left this earth. But I think the majority will be at that moment, like you said. But that's why when we get to the great white throne, the books are going to be open. Books to judge them out of what they did, but also the book of life will be open. They're going to look in the book of life. Is your name in the book of life? And they won't find it there. Now, we know that it said that the Lord died for the entire world, that it was before the foundation of the world, that he knew and, and your names were there. He died for everyone. But that name will be blotted out when you make that final rejection. That's why that song, there's a new name written down in glory and it's mine, is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> it might be a nice thought, but it's wrong. Your name didn't just get written down. God didn't put your name in when you got saved. He put your name in before the foundation of the world because he died for you before you ever were. It's just when you made that final rejection, if you made that final rejection, then it was blotted out. And that's why in the Greek it will say when it talks about the names, that whether the name was permanently written stands continually forever. Any who accepted, the name's permanently there. Any who did not accept, it wasn't permanent because it got blotted out. Is that the same as etched in his hand? Um, is that the same? When it talks about our names being etched in the palm of his hand, in essence, yeah, you could say it's the same because he died for everyone. But I don't know how you, when it's been etched, I don't know how you erase it. In a book, you can see and understand. Well, um, a woman came to me. She really was um, a believer, and she really is prophetic. And she came to me. I didn't know who she was, and I was at, at a congregation. And she said, the Lord wanted me to tell I haven't told you about this. The Lord, wanted, the Lord is telling me that you are etched in his hand. Well, he had already... Um, I, I know this is too much, but he had already kind of confirmed that with me, and then she said that, and I said, well, hallelujah. Sure. That was just a, a word of encouragement to you. You belong to him. You're yeah. his. You're, you're in the palm yes. of his hand. You're in the hand of your saint. Yeah. 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 And remember, too, it's not dependent on what any man says about Amen. you. Yes. It's dependent on your stand between you and the Lord, and he knows the truth. You can fool some of the people some of the time. You can fool all. You can fool all the people some of the time. Some of the people all the time. But you could never fool God. Well, yeah. A confirmation, perhaps. Is sure. That to all right? to encourage okay. you, to, a confirmation to you, absolutely sure. Okay. Sure. Take it at what that was. She want to encourage you. You are His. You're His precious little child. Maybe it had been at a time that you were low and thinking badly of yourself. Maybe it was a time when you were frustrated. I, I blew it. I did this again, yes. Lord. You know, whatever reason. And he just wanted to put that arm around you to reassure you. Why do I believe in eternal security? Because the scripture never gives you any room for anything different. The same way that when you were born into this world, you can't undo that. When you were born again, you can't undo that. Amen. Now, you can break your relationship with your parent. You can rebel against your parent. You can say awful things about your parent. You can go out and do awful things. We see that happen. I grieve for the parents of children who go kill others. And I think what that parent has to live through, how hard it is for that parent. That parent can't say, oh, well, that's not my child. Well, they can say it, but it's not going to hold up in a court of law. That child can even say, I can even go to court and say, I want to be divorced from my parents. And because our court systems are what they are today, even some will allow that. But you know what? That child still is a child of that parent. No matter what the child ever says or does, no matter what the parent ever says or does, that relationship, there's nothing that can sever it completely to where it never existed where it never was. DNA. You can't undo it. Yeah. Yeah. You can't change DNA. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I, again, I'm forgetting the question where we were, but, oh, but, so it wasn't her telling you that you belong to him and, oh, okay, now I feel safe because she told me. No. God knows. He, he knows who's his own. And what you have done he might need to encourage you, just like uh, the prodigal son. <coughs> the prodigal son came back to the father. Remember how the father was? He was out looking. He was out looking for his son. He opened his arms and he welcomed him in. Maybe that's the Lord encouraging you. 
even though you haven't lived perfectly, even though you made that mistake again, even though you did that bad thing and you may have to pay the consequences, you know, there there is consequences for our action. But he's telling you you're still not. I still love you. And really any kind of decent parent causes the best parent. How could that love ever end? You know, even when they grieve you to the and test you to the <laughs> then they turn around and you love them. God's love. Is not uncon is, is unconditional. Is not dependent on us. It reached out to us when we were filthy sinners. Michelle, I also want to add, and you can maybe talk on it. I I feel that we all was created by God. No matter what country we are from, Muslim, mm -hmm. because we do we are so unlike. We're created in God's image. We are still human, and as long as we're human, we still belong to God. Now, yes, do we do wrong things? You don't yes. belong to God without. I mean, not to belong. What I mean, we he created. Like, he still created you. Yes. 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 yes, you are His creation. Yes. Yes. You are His creation. Yes. But when you accept Him, then you become a new creation. So, therefore, we have to love all. And don't jump. Oh, absolutely. There's one race, people. Yes, one There's race. one race. It's You're called the human race. race. Yes. Amen. And there is no reason, no right ever to judge another people less than yourself Amen. by color, by sex, by ability, by whatever. No, 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 and no. And no. <laughs> we are all equal in God's sight. We are all equal. And God loves variety. So that thing you're called ugly, he calls beautiful. I don't think I want to call what God says beautiful. I don't think I want to call it ugly. And I certainly don't want to call it second standard. You know, even even with the Jews and the Gentiles, how many times have you heard me say Gentiles are not second class. You're not the second thought. You weren't an afterthought. You weren't an Oops, you weren't a mistake. There were Gentiles before there were Jews. <laughs> no, no. God loves his entire creation equally, and we should likewise. And we should value anyone else's life. It's valuable because it's been created in the image of God. Be filled with love. Know your love. You may be a mess, but he knows how to clean up messes. <laughs> he takes he takes when he's the potter and he's making the vessel, he takes that lump of clay and he makes something beautiful out of it. And someone even said once he took a precious, beautiful boss, we'll call it a boss, it has class, and it got broken, it got shattered. That's you in your life. You're shattered. But God took gold and he glued you back together and made you more beautiful than you were before. That gold also, it's blood. It's his blood. Yeah. He makes something beautiful. And what he has to work with? <laughs> Amazing God. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved the wretch. Hallelujah. That goes across too. They didn't say the white. They didn't say the black. They didn't say the rich. They didn't say the so-and-so. Whatever. It was amazing grace that loved a wretch like me. Okay. Have we hit the end of questions? Because we are long over time. We will come back into the millennium. Isn't it wonderful to be in the millennium, though? Yes. Our, our questions and our discussion, everything is far more uplifting, is it not? So we will we will see. We will talk about the thrones next week because we're going to see. I saw thrones and they sat on them. Who's the they? Who's sitting on the thrones? Where are the thrones? What's happening from the thrones? That will also bring us into finally what I've been promising you. We'll go through Matthew 25 where we're going to look at the judgments that let you know who entered into the millennial kingdom. How do you get in through that gate? Because God has a criteria. So who gets in, who doesn't? We'll look at that. If you want to read Matthew 25 ahead of time, go ahead and read it. That'll get you a head start because I think we'll be 
pretty close to that right at the start. Yeah, before we get out of verse 4, we'll be in the Matthew 25. So we, it may take us a while to get through this little chapter, but that's because it's packed. There's so much there. Uh, in the Millennial Kingdom, uh, King Jesus will be seated on the throne, right? Will the Millennial people have access to him? Or do yeah, I believe he's like going to be... Like a that, you know, you have to no. invent tapes or whatever. He's going to be sitting on the throne in Yerushalayim. Now, can everybody flood through and crowd around the throne and talk, you know, all at him? I don't know how he'll set up his order, but he's a god of order, so he'll have order in some way. But I believe that, that the millennial people will see the Lord sitting on his throne on earth. At the same time, we know he's on the throne in heaven. How does, how does he do that? That's our Lord. That's our God. Yes, he's not limited. But yes, he will be tangible to them. You know, they will see him and hear him and know his role. His, he's the one, remember, he's the one ruling with that rod of iron. He's the one setting out that judgment. We will be his little judges. We'll be his little peons carrying out what he says. Um, but, yeah, yeah, like Moses when he was ahead and then he had his, the others under him because it, his father-in-law said it. People are going to wear you out. You know, you can't to do it. Well, the people going to wear the Lord out, but everybody coming at him, you know, there has to be a word out. So. Because right now we are always saying we live by faith. Soon we will be living with our sight. But in the millennial it's kind of like reversed. They're now living by sight. They can see the Lord, but they still need to live by faith. Exactly, exactly. That it will be a, a sight as well as the faith of the heart. You know, or faith of the heart based on what they're seeing and hearing and understanding. You know, because they're going to see him as a righteous judge. That, that should put him in awe right there. Do we have one righteous judge on the face of this earth? No. No, I don't care how good a judge is. I heard, I was coming over here to class today, and I heard a Christian lawyer ask, when you know that your client is innocent, you know beyond a shadow of a doubt, you know that they're, they should be in the right, they should be exonerated, what chance do you have when you go into that courtroom for it to come out the way it should? And he said 50-50. 50-50, right there. Yeah, because it's human judges. Anything can happen in that courtroom. We know that. We worry about that when we go into a court of law. We shouldn't worry. We should trust the Lord. But we do. In our humanness, we do worry. We pray when we know someone's standing before a judge that that judge do judge honestly and with right eyes to see and, and to do. But the Lord will, and he will be the ultimate judge. He will be the authority. He will be the authoritative figure. The same way that we hear right now the president thus says, and Netanyahu thus says, and um, who's in England? Um, whatever the name in England. Goodness, where is my brain's gone? Um, all I can think of is Tony Blair. I'm going back to my question. Oh, that's right. Theresa May. Yes. Okay. Well, that's right. Do we recognize in heaven? Number one, why would you know less when you get to heaven than you do here? Number two, when Moses and Elijah came out of heaven and stood at the transfiguration with Yeshua Jesus and the Talmudim looked at these three, they didn't say, who's that? They knew that was Elijah and they knew it was Moses, Moshe and Eliyahu. How did they know? Because they were getting a picture of the future. God enabled them to know and to understand. How many times have we heard testimonies of someone entering into heaven and they see someone who was there to greet them? They knew who was there. Yes, no, we don't know less. We don't lose our memory. Our memory goes on. I know, I'm not going to say it. it doesn't go on steroids. It's better than that. <laughs> but look, look, at, look at the idiot savant, and I hate that name, but I'll use it for its purpose. The savant is brilliant in that one area. It's as if that portion of his brain is working 100% to its capacity. 
the rest is not working that way, and that's why he's called an idiot, because he may not even be able to tie his shoe, but he can give you a mathematical formula that will defy all the, the others that are under him in mathematics or in science or whatever. We've all heard and seen these stories. Well, that gives us a little glimpse, because we're told we use, what, 10% of our brain if we're lucky? Yeah, less than 10%. Well, when we're using the whole brain, and it's working right because it's not tainted by sin. We've got our immortality. <laughs> we won't have to think through and say the right word. We'll be saying the right word. When I think we'll be working like that at that capacity. We'll know and understand so much more. Look at Scripture. We get so excited when we see a new depth of Scripture. We see it open up. We see it. I mean, if you're like me, when you're studying it, it, it's not dead words on a page. It takes on life. We're seeing it in 3D. We're seeing it in action. And the more we study it, the more that we learn, then, oh, this helps us see a new layer here with this. Well, how is that happening? It's because our brain is, the capacity is growing in that one area that we're able to understand more. Take a child in school. You don't teach them algebra in kindergarten. You teach them the fundamentals. They have to learn how to add, subtract, multiply, and divide before they can ever get to any higher level. Well, again, <laughs> we're on that level, but as we grow, we have that capacity to learn the greater. Well, when we have the mind of Messiah in us, yes. now we're using our whole brain. Now we're going to, wow. and yet at the same time, as only we can only understand when we're there, we'll be learning through all of eternity also. So yes. not only will we have the mind of yes. Christ, but that mind's going to expand and grow in some way. Mm -hmm. That's absolutely mind boggling too and I you know, love when, it. And, and, and you know, when we're saying that we're gonna be uh, encouraging those living and there I wonder if we will be telling them we have a book saying, you know, this is what happened when we were before the millennium. And it's an encouragement to, for you to live better, to do, you know, to keep Well, you'll have the various know. scriptures, yeah. at least. You may have other to add on to it, yes, yeah, but you'll at least have the scriptures. And can you imagine when they're studying, David, look at what you do in Israel, okay? If you're a student in Israel, you study like David and Goliath. And then they take you out to where it happened, and you get to see it in its reality. Well, can you imagine during the millennium? They're having Sunday school. <laughs> they're having Hebrew school. And they're studying about David. And a little kid says, um, um, what did David think that day when he put on that armor? How was he feeling? Did he have to go to the bathroom? How did he go to the bathroom? So I got those kind of questions when I talked. And you're going to say, you know what? Hang on just a minute. David. <laughs> and he's going to teach these kids what it was really like. And they're going to meet the real David. And there's going to be no more questions. I mean, the more questions, but I mean, the answers will be there. Isn't it? It's, it's, it's going to come alive. It's going to come I can't wait to meet our Bible characters. I can't wait. I'm emptying my room because we're going so far past. Are we ready to stop and hold the questions for next time? One thing. Yes. How old do you think David was before he slew Goliath? How old was he? Yeah. No, he was older. Oh, he's, he's, he's the youngest. I think before I say it and I eat my words fast. Do you know? Have you Googled? <laughs> no, but what I'm thinking is, is that he was probably more likely five foot five. Oh, David was small. Yeah. 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 And yeah. he took the, the king gave him his armor to wear. The and it king was had to be a pretty he was, big guy. He was still a child. He was young. Yeah. He was young. So he's, he's, he's been anointed the third so time still. by 30. When he first comes against, I'll go study and see if I can get you an age when he comes to, and defends his brothers against Goliath. But he was old enough to be a shepherd boy in the field who had already taken out bears and lions. <laughs> By the power that God gave him, so but he, he definitely was young. I'd like to say 33. And he was he was between 12 and 15 years old. Okay, yeah, so there you go. Yeah, there you go. Okay. 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 And remember, remember, we have we have youth. We have they didn't live as long. You know, we have um, like when when Miriam was pregnant with with Yeshua. 
you know, people say, oh, she was just a child. Well, in our estimation, that age was a child, but in that time, yes. that child was adult-like, you know, at that point. Yes. It's, it's like relative, you know. But I have to go. Did you? I'll text you. I'll text you. I'm going to close in prayer, because we've got to close, okay? So bring your questions, write them down. We love them. We'll discuss whatever we can from the Bible. Lord God, thank you. We praise you again for your wonderful, magnanimous plan. We thank you that we know that, that we belong to you, that there is a day coming you will take us home, and we will be with you forever and ever. And Lord God, we just praise you and thank you and ask that you fill us now that we can serve you better and better each day until that day that you do take us home. Yes. Be with each one, bless them, and help them in their week to come. And thank you, Lord, that we can look forward to next week's study together unless we're around your throne learning it in heaven with you. Yes. Praise you forever in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay.